You know, I had no idea that a sentence could do what he made it do. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Prince Anderson, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Laird Hunt. Today's episode is sponsored by editor Ellen Campbell. Authors, if you are looking for someone to help shape your words into what you originally intended them to be, Ellen uh, can help you do that. Ellen is one of the most sought-after indie editors out today, and she is one of the best. I've used her. So many other people in the community have used her. There's a link to her website in the show notes. I'll be talking more about her as the month goes on. Mindy Tarquinny. Mindy has been a guest on the show a couple of times, and uh, there's some links down in the show notes to her past episodes. I'd like to tell you about her book, The Infinite Now. She was on the show last year to talk about it. This book is mind-blowing and amazing. It was a 2017 Today Show Winter Book Selection, 2017 winner of the USA Best Book Awards. In flu-ravaged Philadelphia, a young immigrant struggles to learn the intricacies of time-bending, teamwork, and living in a world which seems as hell-bent on breaking her spirit as she is to keep it. This is not your mother's historical fiction. Kirkus calls The Infinite now a well-woven tapestry of history, character, and charming mystery. BuzzFeed called it a masterpiece. The Historical Novel Society says Tarquini uses words like a composer. School Library Journal said The Infinite Now is historical fiction portrayed in a new way and declared it a title not to be missed. Do not miss this book. There's a link to it in the show notes at HankGarner.com. I'd also like to thank editor Ellen Campbell for sponsoring the show. Ellen has been a faithful sponsor of the show for quite some time, and she's an editor that I have used. She's someone that I trust. When you're writing a story, you need someone that can have that critical eye that helps your words be better, yet still retain what you meant. That's what a great editor does. She helps you to tell your story the best way possible. Ellen can do that for you. Find her at Ellen Campbell edits.com ellen campbell edits.com thank you ellen for sponsoring the show i'd also like to thank ernest dempsey for sponsoring the show ernest writes a series of books uh, among others uh, called the sean wyatt adventure series i got to be friends with ernest uh, because i had him on the show last year uh, because i discovered his books as a reader and these are some of the best mystery uh, conspiracy theory books that I had found in quite a while. Uh, his newest book is called The Templar Curse. It's been out uh, since the spring, and there's a brand new one coming soon. There are 15 books in this series, and this is one of my all-time favorite series. And uh, and Ernest is a, is a really nice guy as well. He's one of those writers that you love his work, and you love him too. Check out the series in the show notes. The Sean Wyatt Adventure Series by Ernest Dempsey. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Laird Hunt on the show with me today. Uh, Laird has a fantastic new book. It just came out yesterday from when we were recording this, uh, about a week ago when you're hearing this. It's called In the House, In the Dark of the Woods. And uh, guys, this is a... Uh, an eerie, disturbing story, as the uh, as the the uh, subtitle says on Amazon, and it's it it absolutely is. Uh, welcome to the show, Laird. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm excited to have you. Uh, it's that time of year where uh, we we take special interest in uh, spooky stories, and and uh, I'm excited to talk about it. But before we can, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is. What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I, you know, I, I probably I, I put that um, right around the time I went to live with my grandmother in rural Indiana, um, and it was it was just me and my my grandmother in this big farmhouse, and uh, she had a library, and on that library, uh, the shelves of that library, there were fascinating books, books some of which I. I recognized a very few and the rest of them I didn't. And I was really interested in the ones I didn't recognize. Um, 
And over the years, uh, I, I investigated, I explored, and started to get the idea that maybe someday I could do some writing myself. Nice. Um, what were what were some of the books that just really jumped out at you? You know, I I, I would have to say um, after I had had done some exploration of Homer, the Odyssey, and the Iliad, and Dante, um, especially the first volume, uh, the Inferno. Um, it was really probably William Faulkner that that really got my attention, kind of took me by the throat, actually, and 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 held tight and said, you know, here's something ex- extraordinary. Um, I didn't always understand it. I didn't always, I often didn't agree with what I was reading, but man, did I love it. Well, as someone uh, who was born and raised and and lives in the land of Faulkner, uh, just down the <laughs> just down the road from uh, from the Faulkner home, uh, what was it about his writing style, or maybe the stories he told, the uh, the the language he used? What was it that that really grabbed you? You know, I had no idea that a sentence could do what he made it do, and I think that's, <laughs> that's what that's what amazed me. And you know, I, I had I had read some some ornate, intricate prose before I read Faulkner. I'd, I'd read a bit of William, or excuse me, Henry James and and um, dabbled in a little bit of Marcel Proust, but there was something particular about the way Faulkner would use vernacular in the context of those long, ten, multi-tentacled, hydra-headed <laughs> sentences of his that just made me want to try and figure out how you could do it. I don't think I've, I, I have figured out how to do it, but it's kept me interested all these years. Right. Uh, you know, there's, uh, they said Hemingway, uh, you know, never, uh, never liked uh, an adjective or an adverb and, uh, and, and Faulkner never saw one he didn't like. And, <laughs> you know, there's, it's, uh, but yeah, there's something magical about just getting lost in this lyrical prose. Uh, and, and maybe he was kind of the master of that. And, uh, yeah. And, and, and it doesn't matter really what the subject matter is that, that he can pull you in and make you care about those characters and the way he describes them. And he just kind of drops you in the well, you know, he kind of drops you right in the middle of the, the sawdust pile, right? I mean, it, it's it's very much the world that he knew, that he understood, that he was he had been a part of in some ways and outside of, of course, in, in other ways. But, you know, he went after the, the hard stuff, the difficult stuff, and yet he used these amazing sentences to do it. And I like, I like that disjunct. It seemed to me before that that if you were going to get a little bit elaborate, a little bit ornate, you were going to have a kind of – High, highfalutin sort of subject matter to go with it, but that wasn't Faulkner's way at all. At least, you know, in, in the books, the, the great ones that I, I love the most, The Sound and The Fury, Light in August, and Absalom, Absalom, which may be my favorite of all of them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so you, you fell in love with Faulkner, uh, you fell in love with stories, uh, there with your, uh, with your grandmother did, um, what you said that you started thinking that maybe this was something you could do. Uh, what was the first story idea that you had uh, that you started writing down? <laughs> well, th- there there actually were a couple of stabs that that, that predated that um, that more interesting exposure to to the world of literature on my grandmother's shelves, and and one of them was a, um, a an early aborted first uh, chapter of a sequel to the Richard Adams novel Watership Down, and I called it Wound Wart's Revenge, um, which will uh, mean something to some of your listeners and maybe not to others. Uh, but it, it wasn't particularly good, although I was full of ambition. And then my mother tells me there's a, a sci-fi story that I that I started and wrote wrote a few pages of and abandoned. And then the years years went by. Um, and really, what I started doing, even though I had these amazing examples of literature, was writing pretty bad satire uh, <laughs> and, and parody uh, and hum- humorous uh, writing. That was kind of my my high school effort. Um, but you know, it was when I um, I went to college and I studied history. Um, I studied French as well, and um, when it, when I it was done with with my my four years, I went off and taught English in Japan and took a stack of books with me, um, and decided at that point that I was going to be a writer. And I wrote a story called Old Woman, which is really pretty simple. It's about a, a an old woman, much like that grandmother of mine, 
who is peeling potatoes for dinner and getting ready to make, she's making scalloped potatoes. And it goes into a lot of detail about the way she's using her paring knife, the way she's pouring the milk, the way she's um, sprinkling the cheese, that kind of thing. And she's starting, she starts to remember and think about things. And you realize at a certain juncture that no one's coming for this dinner that she's making. Um, and that was, so that, that's kind of where for me, the journey really starts where I got kind of serious about it and felt like I'd done something. And, you know, I looked at that story not that long ago and it was amazing to me that it kind of holds up, not entirely, but it kind of does hold up. The, uh, maybe the, the, the spirit of that story will, will come out, uh, one day in something else, uh, you, you write maybe. I, th I think it's, it's possible. And in some ways, you know, it, it already has, I, I get asked a lot about um, writing from a uh, female perspective as, as a man. And, you know, I, I attribute that also to all those years I spent with this grandmother. And so it makes sense to me that she was kind of the first subject matter for my, you know, it's not her, um, but it's some version of her. Um, and so it makes sense to me that um, she was the focus of that very first serious effort. And that these years later, I, I've, I'm still interested in trying to tell those kinds of stories. Love it. I love it. Um, so you, you spent time in Japan. Um, wh what were some of the books that you took with you? Um, I took uh, some some Steinbeck, um, okay. uh, Cannery Row, and East of Eden. I took uh, some Gertrude Stein on the you know sort of similar era, but a, a very different kind of writer. Um, I took uh, I took some Faulkner along with me to to, to have there and. Hemingway was in the stack as well. And then um, the great Argentinian writer, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, who really kind of broke things open for me and, and showed me how one could experiment um, in, in writing and, again, use, use that experimentation to talk about things of, of serious, interesting import. I, I love to hear people's early influences and, and the things that really shape them as writers and and then look at those things in the context of the things that a writer goes on to write. And uh, you you have these these uh, a lot of these early 20th century um, uh, writer influences and your your stories reflect that. But in a uh, in a in a very different way, um, how would you describe the types of stories that you tell? Well, you know, it's 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 evolved and it's and it's and it's constantly evolving, and that's kind of the way I like it. So I I you know I have a, a, a split trajectory. The the what surrounded that experience with with my grandmother, the, all those years I lived with her, was the years I spent living abroad with my first both my parents and then with my with my father. Um, and so he, you know, he's lived in Hong Kong for 35 years. And I would, so I would be in rural Indiana during the school year with my grandmother and then go off and spend a chunk of the summer in the, that most urban of urban environments, Hong Kong. Um, and that contrast uh, was, was really interesting to me to think about. Um, and I think it helped me grow in a lot of ways intellectually. What I found when I started writing, uh, trying to, to write seriously, despite that first effort writing about my, my grandmother in a rural setting, was that my mind and imagination turned to those urban spaces. And so I've lived in Paris. I've lived in um, uh, Tokyo. I've uh, uh, you know spent, spent all that time in Hong Kong, lived in London, etc. And so in my early novels, like The Impossibly and The Exquisite, it's those urban spaces that are described and and that I'm trying to grapple with. And it's, in, it's really just with these last four books that I've really dug into um, the, the rural experience and that interest in, in history, the deep past and the, and the closer past. Um, and so there have been different types of things that I've gone after. Um, probably, though, you know, at the center of all of them in, in each of those projects, whether it's in a city um, or in the countryside, there is some someone standing there at the center who who is very important. So character is is at the heart of it all for me. Uh, Laird, what was the first story that you wrote uh, that got published? <clears throat> well, that's that I, I that is the that story that I attempted uh, in um, that that I, I wrote about my grandmother, old woman. I wrote that in Japan. And I was a member of the Tokyo Writers Workshop. It was my first experience with anything like creative writing. It wasn't instruction. It was just writers getting together once a month to, to share stories. And I presented this. 
And there was a, a person there who ran a, a journal, very small journal called Printed Matter, and he said he would like to publish it. And I thought, you know, it was what an amazing thing to have happen with the first serious story you wrote. And then it was about five years until I had another one published. But, <laughs> you know, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Uh, did you continue teaching in the meantime? So I, you know, I didn't start, I kind of took up teaching a little bit late. Um, after that experience in Japan teaching English, I, um, I went back, you know, went to school, um, uh, studied some writing more formally. I'd gotten inspired by the experience on, on every month in, in Tokyo. Um, and I didn't take teaching back up until about a decade later when I, when I got into teaching in, in the universities. In the meantime, I was a, a press officer at the United Nations and, and did all kinds of different jobs. So teaching as, as a more uh, extended thing came kind of late for me. Okay. Now, as, as a press officer, um, how, do you, how do you feel like a job like that uh, affects your, uh, your writing now? Do you, do you feel like you picked up anything? Uh, I mean, that, that seems to be, to me, uh, a job where words most definitely matter and, and that there's probably a lot of um, – you know, hand wringing over getting things exactly right. Does, does having a job like that and working in that type of field, does that affect, um, your, uh, the way you write fiction? It, it really had a big impact in a lot of ways. Those, those five years that I was, um, at the United Nations, um, doing that job were, were really, really important. Um, Absolutely for the way I thought about writing and the way I, I wrote. And, and to this day, I write quickly um, and with a sense of urgency when I'm doing it. I kinda, it kind of got scared into me because we would, you know, so we were covering meetings of the General Assembly, its subsidiary committees, and then also the Security Council. Um, and uh, we would write these summaries. We weren't transcribing. We were writing newsy summaries while things were happening. Um, and um, every third or fourth meeting, we would have a diplomat from whatever country it was who was dissatisfied with us or who had been told to be dissatisfied with us come roaring into the office to, to yell that we had, we had misquoted them, we had missummarized them, it had to be changed, that sort of thing. And so it was a, it was a pretty high stakes environment. Um, and so I, I got this idea that when I had a little bit of time to write, I was going to really take advantage of it and hope no one yelled at me afterwards. Uh, and I, I still kind of feel that way. Um, so there was that. There was and that attention to getting it right, to being accurate, to finding the right word. And then there was the fact that I was surrounded in that press office by writers from all over the English speaking world in one half the office and writers from all over the French speaking world in the other. And many of them were novelists and playwrights and poets, uh, and almost all of them had been journalists in one capacity or another. So they were really, really inspiring, and many of them could not go home um, because of their writings, because of their political opinions. They were not allowed to return, or if they did so, they'd be in, uh, potentially in, in grave danger. And so that gave me a sense that there were real stakes to this um, idea of, of putting words out into into the world, um, that it wasn't just something that one did and threw it out there and no one cared um, and there were no consequences. So that that's another way that experience impacted me. So what brings you back around to writing fiction? <clears throat> you know, it really never, I, I never got very far away from it. Once it got its hooks into me, um, that idea that you could talk about the world but find different ways to talk about it, right? So, if you know, in, in my case, I and, and with these these recent novels that deal with the past, I like to follow the the British novelist Hilary Mantel's idea that once you know you do your research, you get the facts of the matter as as insofar as they exist, and you hammer those down almost like they're pillars in 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 the construction of a building, and then you can do what you want around that, right? So where there's a gap in knowledge. And that's what human, you know, humans, we, we live in those gaps in knowledge. There are some things that we understand and many things that we don't. And fiction is really good at um, dealing with both of those things in, in, in tandem. So what was, uh, I, I'm really fascinated by, um, by your book, um, Never Home. Mm -hmm. 
Where did the where did the idea for that book come from? So, like like many good things in my life, it, it it initially came in the form of a gift from my wife, Eleni Sicilianos, who's a poet. She gave me a copy of a uh, a book of letters um, called An Uncommon Soldier, and it was uh, the Civil War letters home of a soldier whose name was Lyons Wakeman, um, who was from uh, a rural New York gone down to fight in the war, Lyons Wakeman had uh, something uh, extra interesting about him. It's, it's that Lyons Wakeman, uh, before the war, was Sarah Wakeman. Um, and uh, Sarah Wakeman had decided, actually, um, even before the conflict started, that to, to make money, she, she grew up in poverty, she would um, disguise herself as a man and, and find work, as quite a few women did in the 19th century in the United States. And she was working as a boatsman when the war broke out and was recruited as a boatsman and spent the rest of the war fighting in disguise um, and sent these letters home. And this this book is really wonderful. And I'd never heard about this. And uh, the uh, introduction to the book talks about how this is kind of forgotten history. Um, and in fact, it's kind of erased history. Uh, and so there, there were um, uh, women who did this on both sides of the conflict. So there were women from the South or women from the North who did this, and, and they numbered it in the hundreds. Uh, and after the war, um, there was an effort to um, erase some of this history because it just didn't fit with the image of um, the, the valiant soldier who had gone out to do his patriotic duty. Um, and yet here were these, these people, they did it for all kinds of reasons. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Wakeman, Lyons Wakeman did it for, for money, but others did it for patriotism. Others did it for adventure. Um, others did it for love. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff. And I'll tell you what, I, I, um, didn't start writing the book immediately, but once I decided to, to really try to do it, it was hard to stop doing the research and actually do the writing because it was so fascinating. How do you um, approach a story like that where there's uh, all of these fascinating nuggets of historical fact um, where and, and you said it was hard to stop doing the research and, and actually get into the story. So at what point does uh, does the story uh, come alive to you where you can transition from uh, from what did happen to what might have happened? Mm, yeah, I like I like that distinction. Um well, so I, I should say that when I do this, unlike some people who, who write about the past, um, I, uh, I start writing pretty early when I, when I kind of sniff out the, the idea that I, you know, that, that I'm going to go for something with, 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 you know, in a, in a longer form, that I'm interested in maybe writing a novel. I start writing pretty early in the research process, and then it becomes a kind of push-pull. I go back and forth. Um, I, I've tried a couple times just, I'm going to do a whole bunch of research. I'm going to pile up all the information and then I'm going to set to writing and it just didn't go anywhere. It was kind of, it was a misfire in both those cases. But with Never Home, I read this book that my wife had given me quite a few years went by and then I, you know, remembered the idea. It was the 150th anniversary of the civil war. It kind of bubbled back into my mind and I started writing and then I went, hit the books again um, did more research. Uh, and so it goes back and forth for me. And that's indeed how I wrote all four of these novels that are set in the past in a kind of push pull between the research and the imagination, um, between what happened and as you put it, what, what might have happened. Um, and that kind of, I feel like it keeps me honest. I think if I was ever able to just leap off from the pile of research, pretty quickly I'd be taking liberties with those those pillars that, that I'd, I'd discovered, hammered down for myself, um, and leave it behind entirely. So what comes to you first? Uh, and you start sniffing out the story pretty early, um, you say, uh, but when when it starts taking form, is it does it come in the form of, of a character that reveals herself uh, in this situation, uh, or is it a, is it the setting? And then you you start walking around in the setting looking for the story. Uh, how does that start to take form for you? You know, it's it's a funny it's a funny kind of in between thing for me. In, in the case of these historical novels, it really was the language, and it was really. Um, very specifically the first sentences. So the novel Never Home starts with the sentence, 
I was strong and he was not. So it was me who went to war to defend the Republic. And that came to me fully birthed, if you will. Um, I never changed it. Um, and out of that sentence, which I could see it, right? So it was something in between language and an image. Um, and the evocation of that, this character, who said that? You know, I wanted to know who had said that line. Um, and out of that, that line and that slightly, um, uh, unusual way of shaping the language, um, this character started to bloom up. So even if, you know, it was the first, it was the sentence first, very soon after that, this character, um, and came to mind. And, and I should say that my character was not Sarah Wakeman. Um, it was not any of the historical figures. It was some, uh, amalgamation of, of all of those individuals. Um, and, you know, once uh, that the character of Neverhome, Ash Thompson, established herself, she kind of took over. And then it was me really just trying to keep my keep my uh, pen moving fast enough, if you will. It's uh, it's so funny when that happens. It's like, um, you know, there's this uh, ethereal uh, nature to writing that uh, you can have all of the pieces. You can have all of the. Uh, the influences and all of the things that will ultimately um, go into a story, but there's there's just a piece of magic that comes in that makes the thing come alive sometimes. And when it when it's not there, you really feel it. And I wish <laughs> I wish I could. It's oh, really I wish, not there. I wish I knew what it was because boy, there are so many times when it just isn't there. And I I, I have what I feel like is is kind of a cool idea. Um, and I write it and I just, you know, I beat the horse dead and it just never comes alive. Uh, and, you know, that's just, I guess that's just part of it. As you say, it's, it's, it's something that it's there or it's not. And, you know, I teach, I teach writing, um, I teach creative writing and I, I don't know how to tell people what that is, but I know what it is when I see it. Right. Um, so you've written four, um, historical, uh, novels, now with the uh, in the house in the dark of the woods is the the latest one. Um, have you pinned down exactly what it is about these types of stories that uh, uh, that that draw you in? I, I think of these starting with so kind one never home the evening road and then then the most recent one in the house in the dark of the woods. I, I kind of think of them all as as revolving around crucible issues or moments. In, in American history. So people in particularly intense moments, but who are not necessarily the ones you might expect to be encountering in that moment. I mean, that's part of what's intrigued me about all of these books. It's the, it's the character who's a little bit off to, off to the side, the, the character in the group photograph who's in the back row to the right, um, rather than front and center. Um, in, in history and in literature, these stories that have either been, uh, mostly forgotten or largely erased. Um, and yet, you know, these were people who might have been alive during slavery, who might have been um, alive during the time of the Civil War, the Jim Crow era, um, or indeed in the Puritan uh, vortex of the, the late uh, 17th century. Um, so, yeah, th these moments where a lot is at stake, uh, in the moment and that also we still feel the repercussions of. So whether it's racism, whether it's oppression because of gender, um, whether it's a war context, these things that are still unraveling and revealing themselves to us even here in the 21st century. And, and those, those tertiary characters, those on the, on the back row in the group photo, uh, those, those characters hold so much potential. Um, it, it's so many times we want to focus on, on the star of the story on the, uh, and there's so much story that's left on the table when we do that. There, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, and that's always what has interested me is, is, you know, who will speak for what is beside the point? Who, who will, will attend to the margins? Who is looking in those directions? You know, most of us are living in that space and it's a curious thing of the, the human paradigm that we're so drawn to the the stars of whatever our moment is um, and yet there is so much interesting life happening you don't have to look very far um, I, I have to say it's it's constantly bubbling all around um, and so 
you know, those, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in having those conversations with people in my own life who are not the famous ones, but are the, man, are they the interesting ones? Um, and then also when I'm thinking about the past, in, in ferreting out to some extent um, those kinds of lives that were deeply, richly lived, um, but maybe a little bit in the shadows. Well, it gives us a, a really warped uh, sense of history when we focus on uh, the, uh, the the center stage story, uh, and and part of that is you know the, your your view of history gets more and more narrow the farther away you get from it, um, partly out of necessity of just uh, communicating all of the things that have happened that your uh, you know the the funnel gets gets smaller as it goes. Uh, but I, I think it it does we we run the risk of of having a very revisionist view. Uh, of history by only focusing on a couple of stories. I, th I think that's right. And, you know, if you think about um, the, the Civil War, which is something that, you know, a lot of people have turned their artistic attention to, documentary attention to, and, um, you know, it's, it's history, it's also been imagined. Um, it's still the case that we are so fascinated by those extraordinary figures of the Civil War, the Grants and the Lees, um, and, uh, the, you know, sort of the generals and the presidents, uh, uh, so to speak. Uh, and, and yet, you know, for me, where the action is, where the interest lies is, is, is elsewhere. And to the extent that, you know, when I'm reading these, when I was reading the Civil War diaries of, you know, just soldiers on the line, they were not endlessly going on about what, um, Colonel so and so or General so and so was was wearing and you know what valiant thing they'd done recently. And they were talking about what they they were dreaming about eating and how they wished they could take a bath and how the, how they wished it would stop raining and how basically they just wanted to get home. And so it just didn't make sense to me to get into the the mind of someone who was in that situation. And this goes for the other novels as well to just start. Um, going on and on about the the great figures. Most of us just don't live our lives that way. Well, and and the the people that were on the line fighting, um, I, I would venture that a lot of them, if not most of them, um, could have cared less about the politics involved. And and you know these were people that that believed they were fighting for their home or or for uh, you know some some grand gesture of of a, the the republic um, and. And we look back and, and we we try to give everyone the same motivations that that we now understand. Well, this is this is what should have been done. This is we did this for this reason. And um, the, the reality is, a lot of those people's their story doesn't include those things. Like you said, they're they're just trying to survive. They they want to keep their family intact, and that's where real drama comes. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. And you know, it's it's. We do we do a disservice when we um, effectively essentialize uh, people from the past. Imagine that they were all one way. Ascribe our own motivations to all of them. Um, you know, this came up in the context of these women I was writing about who had done this thing to, to disguise themselves as men, gone to the war. And when I had some early conversations with people about it, they said, "Oh, well, these were these were people clearly who who wanted to be another gender," um, and. That was certainly the case in, you know, for some of them, for some of them, we have no idea. For others, they document their other motive motivations. Um, it's just, you know, it's all too easy to say it's, it's this one thing and that all the, the young men who went to war were doing it for, for patriotic reasons. A lot of them did it because they were, they were bored and they, or they, you know, they had an abusive father or a bad or were pressed into service. Absolutely. Or were pressed into service. Um, and, you know, that's always been the case. So, man, I, I think you always have to, to go in and, and turn, you know, the people were 3D in their own lives. And so make them 3D on the page as, as well as you can. Well, it's really difficult as a reader to approach a story uh, without bias. We, we all bring our own uh, biases to the story. We, we bring our own political beliefs. And, and then uh, – but something happens uh, when you get into the story and those things start to disappear and you start to um, – uh, to relate and empathize with the characters. And that's one, that's one magical thing about, about storytelling. Um, so when, when you're approaching colonial New England, uh, in the new book here, uh, 
how do you, I mean, th- this book is so, um, fascinating and engrossing. Uh, I, I completely set aside everything that I thought I knew, uh, and, and the story just owned me. Um, where did the story come from? Why did you decide to tackle colonial New England? And, uh, was there a certain topic or issue, uh, that you were thinking about in the beginning? So this, this book um, started as, well, I'll, I'll back up. So I, I was, um, I, I was in the, in the middle, middle of the writing of Kind One and Never Home and went for a, a, a trip in, in late spring, or, or uh, excuse me, early spring, late winter uh, in upstate New York around Cherry Valley where, where my wife has family. And we were taking a walk, and it was a, a rainy, sleety day on a gravel road um, surrounded by pretty deep woods. And there was a, a, a very much abandoned house at the end of the road. And, and somehow this idea of someone walking and someone seeing this, this house, right? So something as, as element, elemental as that. So in this case, it was that kind of feeling before the language came to me um, that, that occurred. Uh, so, so the, 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 the story gets its start there. It's, and it was a, um, uh, turned into, it really was more like a short story when I, when I first wrote it. Um, and then I continued working on Never Home. I, I continued working on Kind One and then the Evening Road. And as I went, I kept coming back to this, um, story and I was really interested in how some of the issues that were coming up in, as I was writing it. So this woman who is, um, who goes for a walk in the woods and gets lost. Uh, does she get lost? Is she doing it willingly? Why is she leaving? The motivations were really similar to some of the ones I was confronting in Kind One, which is set in, in uh, time of slavery, um, and say The Evening Road, um, which is set during the Jim Crow era, where there's a lot more to the character's story than even she is able to tell at the start of telling the story. Um, and I, I was thinking about these connections, right? So Puritan New England, it's a very, um, it's sort of an emphatically uh, constricted society. Uh, people know each other. So the, the, the communities are, are small. People go to church. They go to the same church. They follow the same practices. If you don't, if you step out, if you swerve, you're in trouble. Think about the Quakers. Um, and the persecution, early persecution of them in, in colonial New England um, and, and, and so many others. And, and I was thinking about how that's not very different from the experience uh, of someone living in the 1850s in, in, uh, in the hinterlands of Kentucky, perhaps a young woman uh, in that situation. And so I was feeling that moving across, the, uh, across time and the centuries. And where does the American story start? Um, around some of, some of these issues. And, and so I wanted to, I, 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 I should say, I really enjoyed going back and, and digging around in, in the beginnings of the, the, the European and American, uh, part of the, of this story. Cause of course there are many others. So what, uh, if someone is, is not familiar with the story, how would you describe, um, What's going on? Uh, and we've you, you've tackled American history. This goes way back um, to our formative uh, time uh, in this country. Um, what's going on in this story? So this is this is kind of history meets fairy tale. History gets embroiled in fairy tale and fable. Um, what happens when you step off the path, as it were, the path as you understand it, thinking about something like Dante's Inferno? Um, what happens when you um, get lost um, midway through your life uh, and you find yourself somewhere else? So in some ways, it's a kind of fundamental story. Um, so that's the, the grander scheme of it for me. Then it's just about there's a, there's a young woman. She is living in a ho- isolated house with a with her husband and her son. And she says, as she you know, at the beginning of the book, she says, I, I went out to pick berries, and I said that I'd be back late. Um, and then she she talks about what happens, how she gets drawn into the woods, and it's really important to me that this not be a symbolic woods. Um, that this be a real woods made with trees that, that grew in New England, then native native species, native shrubs, native um, uh, birds uh, and animals, flora and fauna, all of it, um, that she's walking through and she's feeling it. And yet she's stepping into a space 
that's different from the one she was in. It's the space of stories of fable, um, and it's a dark story and it's a dark fable. When you uh, when you start telling stories um, set in the in the real past, uh, like your your previous books that deal with um, uh, the Civil War or Jim Crow, um, neither one of us were alive in those two uh, eras. Although uh, I think I'm I'm close to your age. I think I'm a, a couple of years younger than you. Um, but. But I remember as a kid growing up in the 70s um, that I, I can remember seeing remnants of those things. And 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 thank God we have we have moved uh, past a lot of that or at least moved forward. Um, let's not give ourselves too much credit uh, sometimes. But, you know, at, at least we're moving forward. Uh, but I still remember uh, a lot of things that uh, that I'm not happy about, you know, in, in our past. So we still see remnants of that. When you're talking about the colonial era, this is a time that is so far removed uh, from the way most of us live. The, um, the, the, uh, the, the connections to the old world are, are still very real. Um, it's still a brand new uh, frontier for uh, a lot of people. And, uh, how was approaching this story where, where there really is a big disconnect, um, different from one of your previous stories where, you know, we can almost reach out and touch those times. Um, it, it, is it, is it almost like writing fantasy, uh, when you're so far disconnected, uh, in a book like this? That, you know, that, that's kind of how I experienced it. So I, when I was first entertaining this idea, I knew that something scary was going to happen. So when I was on that woods on that, that road with the abandoned house, the idea came to me as something that was going to be frightening. Um, but when I really first started writing, I thought I was going to be doing something that was more like kind one, more like never home and the evening road. Um, and that it was going to cleave to the facts of the matter more rigidly. But, you know, as you say, the farther back in time you go, um, the hard, the, the the sparser um, those facts are, and we know quite a, quite a little bit about um, the about Puritan New England, um, where the Puritans came from, um, and so it's it's not as if it's completely unknown. It's not like going back to to pre biblical times, that sort of thing. Um, but nonetheless, I found that the deeper I got into the project, the deeper I got into the woods of the project, if you will, um, the more the book was in working in the space of something that was more like fantasy, um, that was uh, heavy on the imagination. Um, now, whenever I felt myself going too far, there had to be a check-in with some concrete object. So whether that was the way a fireplace might be arranged, um, the fact that uh, uh, herbs were hung on the walls rather than uh, arranged on shelves. That that kind of thing was really, really useful to me. So even if we get pretty far into the woods in this novel, we return to the physical structures of the moment, to the, uh, the belief systems of the moment. Um, and for me, that was really important. So it never goes full-fledged into a, a sort of alternate parallel universe. Um, it's, the, it's the world as we know it, but it's the world as we know it seen through a fever dream. Well, and for me, as, as a reader, uh, that makes the story more compelling, uh, more scary. Uh, the, the fact that these, these things can be happening, if we can relegate that to, um, uh, to the world of fantasy, to an alternate thing, to maybe uh, even a dream. Uh, but when you anchor those things with these real details, uh, that they make me more scared about the world because uh, this this maybe is possible. There, were, you know, the, I, I mentioned earlier the the novelist Hilary Mantel and um, her fiction is wonderful. She also has a. Um, a memoir, and, and the title of it is, is escaping me right now. But there's this moment in it that was really useful to me in thinking about what what scares me. Um, she describes the first time she grew up in a very religious household um, and believed very deeply. And her first encounter with um, something that she would, you know, something uh, that she would still refer to as evil was um, really just a glimpse at the far edge of the garden where she was playing as a child and something um, off in the distance moved that shouldn't have moved. It was like a, a quivering in the air, a bend um, of the afternoon light. 
um, that shouldn't have happened. And for her, that absolutely filled up with the presence of something malevolent. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's really those, you know, what happens when something falls over that shouldn't fall over. Um, those are the things that have always gotten me the most. It's not the jump scares of the, you know, those, those are bad enough, right? That you see in movies though, that the, 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 the gimmick now at this point of the, of the jump scare of sudden acceleration, it's no, it's really what happens when you've got a, a coil of rope that's lying on the, on the ground and suddenly it, it quivers a little bit. That's the kind of thing that gets to me. And so it was in, in this novel, um, it was returning to those kinds of objects, to those kinds Kinds of gestures um, and uh, just warping them ever so slightly uh, and things can get pretty weird. Um, Laird, all of your books have allowed us to look at, um, at a period in the past and to uh, get a different view on it and to maybe try to understand uh, what, what people were going through there, uh, on both sides of the situation, uh, what, how people handled, uh, the, the things with, uh, with what they were dealt, uh, and, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, the, the way we look back on things. Uh, what, what were you allowed to do in this book by, with the setting, with these characters? Um, what were you allowed to look at? Um, that maybe helped you understand this era more than you ever did. Um, well, that, you know, that, that's that's a really interesting question, and uh, you know, thinking about what fiction can do versus n a non-fictional account of something. Um, I was, you know, there's there's a moment um, fairly deep in the novel where the the main character, the principal narrator, gets to fly. Uh, and she rises up into the air, uh, in a, uh, not on a broomstick, uh, but in something that it shouldn't fly but does. Uh, and she gets this kind of perspective on the world um, and really, in a way, on her life and on where she's come from. She sees things from above when, at, at, a, at a moment where no one had seen things from above in, in that way. Um, and... That w was really useful to me as well, thinking about what, what happens when you look at the, the, a, a, a town in early New England from the sky um, or a landscape, the, the enormity of a forest, um, thinking about how gigantic those spaces would have seemed. I think we kind of miniaturize the past. Um, we put it into s snow globes um, of, of our imaginations and our perceptions and our and, and our own preoccupations. But there was something about those moments where the character gets to do something extraordinary. At, at, at another moment, she swims down to the bottom of a well, uh, which is a terrifying. I'm slightly claustrophobic, and the idea of swimming down a well <laughs> uh, to the bottom to fetch something is just about the. <laughs> I, I talked about ropes moving and so forth, but chuck me down a well and, and I, I would be about as unhappy as you could imagine. But you know, that, that was something else, that idea of shifting perspective, the places that a human can find uh, him or herself um, uh, really came alive to me in a different way with this book. So, to, so, so that idea of different kinds of ways of being colliding. Um, there are uh, Native Americans in this book. I, I refer to them as first folk. Um, uh, but they are living a very different paradigm that's sitting alongside of it being encroached on by this, um, th these things that are going on in, in the woods that, that my character Goody finds herself in. And so thinking about that as well was, was really useful. Keeping that in mind and remembering that as, as I told this story uh, was, was a useful corrective, I think. Uh, it, it's very fortuitous that this book comes out uh, a couple of weeks uh, from Halloween and this time of year where we start thinking about spooky stories. Um, we also know that, uh, that the, the publishing life of a book is, is you, you more than likely have been working on this for a couple of years, uh, if not maybe a little more. Uh, did you, did you know that this book was going to be, um, this kind of book from the beginning and, and would be, uh, one of those perfect books for this time of year. You know, well, it was kind of a dream come true for it to, for the, the publisher to get excited about Little Brown to get excited about bringing it out at Halloween. Um, I had pipe dreamed about that. I knew it was going to be a, a, a scary book. I didn't know quite 
how scary it would be or how eerie or disturbing it would be, but I knew it was going to be in that vein. But I, I certainly talked about that and, and how much fun it would be to have it come out, uh, to, to have this orange red uh, book with a wolf on its cover um, out, out around Halloween. Um, sounded pretty amazing. Of course, when I was thinking about this, I didn't know that they do such such a fabulous cover for it. Um, but but I do feel like it'll sit awfully nicely next to a jack o' lantern. Well, and the the book cover there, there's a link to it in the show notes at hankgarner.com, dot com. But uh, it's one of those that you kind of want to take the dust jacket off and hide that <laughs> um, because it, it's a creepy, creepy cover. And when you guys see it, you'll you'll know what I mean. Um, Laird, I love this book. Um, I, I love that, that you were able to bring it out this time of year. Um, it, I, I feel like we've, we've kind of walked around the story, uh, because I want people to read this for themselves. Uh, and, and I don't want to give away too much, but if you're looking, uh, for the, the ultimate, uh, spooky read this time of year, uh, but knowing, uh, that this is a book that, that handles the subject matter and taken with the care that you are known for taking uh, your historical books. Um, th- th- this book is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to send everybody to pick up a copy of it. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, if people are just learning about you and your work, uh, are are you available online anywhere where people could uh, connect with you, maybe uh, look through your back catalog and find out more about what you do? Well, I'm, I'm pretty active um, on Twitter and um, on Facebook and Instagram. So all of the, all those places, look me up, send me, send me a, a, a shout. Um, I'd love, I would love to hear from you. The, the, uh, my publisher, Little Brown has a, has a, as a page devoted to the book and to my, to my work more generally. Um, and so, you know, Hey, I just love, I just love to hear from people. Excellent. Well, we'll link up all that and, uh, and your Amazon page where people can see all of, all of your work there in the show notes. Uh, Laird, uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Hey, today. Thanks. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Thanks for listening to the author stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. You took a terrible risk tonight. Why? You don't know? The first rule. I was told by a friend that I shouldn't reveal my gift to anyone who doesn't have a gift themselves. That's exactly right. Because everyone we tell dies. Yes. You might have marked me for death. Made you a target for a ghost. Why can't people know what we can do? What makes it so dangerous? Valerie took up the fireplace prongs and stabbed the logs. It's called the Great Curse. Sparks exploded from glowing crevices and drizzled upwards, ricocheting off the black belly of the cauldron turning into tiny ashes that disappeared up the chimney. It was cast by a powerful witch over 300 years ago. Witch? Sorry, but witch? Please, there's no such thing. Valerie closed her eyes. A spoon leapt from Jason's dish and caught him in the temple. He wiped melted ice cream from his cheek. You were saying... She cast the curse to stop the witch trials. In Salem? Jason searched his memory. 1690... 1692. They burned her alive in the Salem Common. The only witch to be burned. The cauldron smoked slightly. Its contents had evaporated. A sharp, charred scent filled the room. Wait, said Jason. There were no witches. They were just, I don't know, victims of religious hysteria, right? So you're saying the witch trials were justified? Justified? So if a witch did exist, it would be okay to kill her? No, I just thought... You're right, never mind. There was one witch in Salem, at least. A woman with a powerful gift. She only wanted to protect people like us, to give the gifted their anonymity, refuge. She cast the great curse as she burned. She proclaimed that 
mortals who know a witch shall know death. And that is the great curse. And it's still in effect after all this time. Mortal, as in non-gifted. No mortal can know about you, about any authentic witch. Jason winced. Isn't there another word besides that? She shrugged. So no one can know what I am, what I can do, or else they become a target. Right. The spirit world will obey the great curse and try to kill them. The spirit world. The other realm. Jason rubbed his eyes. How much of this was reality and how much of this was Valerie's nutty brand of mysticism? He felt himself pulling back, as usual, for fear of contagion. He'd spent his whole life reading science fiction. He hated paranormal tales. This was... this was... not his genre. <laughs>